I just want to say uh, two, th two things about uh, Miguel, is it right spoken? Miguel, yeah, okay. He studied uh, industrial design engineering and product engineering uh, in Valencia and afterwards at the Technical University of Delft, strategi uh, strategic product design with a specialization in technology for sustainable development, which uh, is, as we know, uh, this project. I don't read all your uh, stations, so please, it's your uh, stage. Thanks. That was long. Um, so I wanted, thanks. So I wanted to make a joke before because this is what shows you why standardization is important, right? I'm connected to one, two, three, four, five adapters, but it works, so it's great. But uh, this is great also to see. Um, anyway, I'm going to start not introducing myself because uh, you did already very well, and also not introducing to Fairphone yet. I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, who knows who this guy is? Does it ring a bell, Milton Friedman? Like uh, an exponent of the free market and uh, free economy. Um, I don't really agree with a lot of what he says, but he has an uh, amazing video that you should see on YouTube where he talks about the pencil. And I'm going to use his example to introduce Fairphone. So in his video, which I totally recommend you to see, even though you probably hate this guy, but just listen to what he says. Um, he introduces the pencil, no? And how a pencil is made. And he uses the pencil, well, you probably know, a pencil is made from, you know, graphite inside, there is wood. Not this one, I just stole this one from there. It's not made of wood, but imagine just a normal pencil. A uh, little bit of metal, there's rubber. And in his video, he explains how all these materials come from very different countries in all, the, all over the world, in, in, including or especially also the, uh, for such a simple uh, product. Now, it's quite amazing that still such a simple product has so many materials from so many different parts of the world. And he also talks about all the people that are behind these materials and how these people are actually working in all of these materials without necessarily knowing what the end product is. These people may not know each other, they may be from different cultures, speak different uh, languages. Um, but he also says that the, the, the amazing uh, free market and uh, uh, you know, the, the system of uh, demand and, and, and offer will make that in the end there is a product that is very cheap to sell and that makes you know, like this free economy so great. No? And he talks about harmony and about how um, all this system will, you know, in the end, make these supply chains that are nearly perfect and everything works perfect. Well, we know and you've heard from the previous speaker that that's not the case. Um, but just, just watch this video because it's very, uh, it's very nice to see. So imagine if he's talking about pencils. Imagine if we would talk about smartphones, right? So pencil maybe has like four or five materials, but a smartphone has hundreds of different components that sometimes are made from hundreds of different materials. Um, I will always remember when we got the full material declaration of our screen and I saw that it's an Excel file of 250 lines for a screen and every line is a material. Just to give you an ex uh, uh, and just building upon uh, the previous speaker about the complexity of all these supply chains. So in this complexity, there's a lot of social and environmental issues that are uh, raised and I will not uh, go on them again. You, you've heard and you probably know. Um, and this is pretty big, no? And then when you want to do something about it, you think like, wow, uh, this is impossible to change because we are nearly talking about how our economy works, like Milton Friedman was talking about as well. But um, with Fairphone, we uh, decided to start small, like there's no other way, obviously. So Fairphone started um, as an awareness campaign, actually, back in 2010. And this is the first team you see already Baz, who is uh, the other co-founder, and you see Bibi there, who is also working with us now. Um, this was the first team that uh, went to Congo to understand what was the reality on the ground. Is this working properly? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and then they, they interviewed uh, miners, and they, they, they just really tried to understand what was happening and um, what was this you know, conflict minerals that everybody was talking about. And they came back with this stone. This is, uh, this is actually from the south of Congo. This is a, a park called Katanga. And that's, um, I don't remember the name of the mineral, but you get cobalt from that mineral. Um, 
this, with this tone, Baz, uh, uh, your co-founder, went to KPN, which you probably know is the, one, the biggest operator in the Netherlands. And he knew somebody there, and then he managed to get into this very important meeting with important, meet, uh, important people from KPN. And he put this stone, this is real story, he put the stone on the table and he said, guys, I'm going to make phones from this stone and I want you to help me. And that was really the beginning. So KPN signed a contract and said, okay, these guys are a bit crazy, maybe they can do something, but we'll sign a letter of intent that we will buy 1,000 phones when these phones get to the market. So this is how Fairphone started. For a couple of years, it was that, an awareness raising campaign. So there was a lot of workshops where we talked uh, on topics on like repairability, for instance, why you know, our devices are made in a way that are very difficult to repair. We were talking about the situation in the mines of Congo, where these materials came on your phone, really just to, to raise the curiosity uh, of people. This was in a, in a music festival in the Netherlands. So that was 2011 uh, and half of 2012. Um, but at some point, uh, we also realized that, you know, we can just keep on talking about it, but we can actually also do something about it. And you can make a sign and be angry on the street, but you can just maybe start small and try to change it from within the system. And that's also important to, to understand about Fairphone. We decided to move from an awareness campaign into a company, so we officially under the law, we are a for-profit company um, because in the Netherlands, there's nothing like social enterprises in the law. But we are a social enterprise, so we are a B Corp certified social enterprise, which means that uh, we have a social mission, not a profit-making uh, mission. We are today a group of uh, 70 enthusiasts in Amsterdam and traveling the world, uh, trying to solve all this or tackle some of these issues that we are talking about. We mostly work in four areas. So we work in the origin of materials. So for, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but you know, we've been able to trace four of the supply chains all the way to the mine and work with mines that are out of conflict, but still in countries that very much need uh, uh, this economic uh, trade, like Congo, uh, like Rwanda, like Peru. Um, we work on the design of the phone, as I was saying. So Fairphone 2 is a modular uh, device that is uh, very easy to repair. We work on working conditions, which the focus mostly is in worker representation in some of our suppliers, and reuse and recycling, where for instance in recycling we have some projects in Ghana where we recover electronic waste that would make it to the landfill anyway, uh, and we recycle it properly in Belgium. Just to give you a little bit an overview of the activities, then I wanted to quickly show you um, if this works our website. So as a social enterprise, we have a model that is also very transparent. So we, we want to inspire all these stakeholders in the industry. And when we say stakeholders in the industry, we don't only talk about companies. We also include consumers. We also include politicians because everybody has a little bit that needs to do. So um, everything that we do, do, we publish. We publish raw data very often so that other people can also analyze and you know, say what they think about it. Because as the previous speaker was also saying, you know, like the definition of fair is also very difficult to put, right? And uh, for what is fair for somebody is not fair for another one. So we very much take the approach, I mean, we have our own ideas, obviously, but we also very much take the approach of just publishing all the raw data of the projects that we do. So for instance, social assessments in suppliers that we are doing. Now we are running a chemical assessment in another supplier. Um, for instance, we publish all the suppliers that we know of, and there is an interactive tool on our website where, you know, with uh, some patients, you can actually see a lot of our supply chain. So it has to be dynamic because it's so complex that you have to move around the world to see what all these components are. So if you click on it, uh, it tells you what the component is, what is the factory that has been um, uh, producing it, and where it goes as a, the next step in the supply chain. For some parts of the supply chain, we are able to trace very much back. So like the four materials that we were talking about. So those are tin, tantalum, um, tungsten, and uh, gold. Those are ones that we can uh, trace all the way to the mine. For others, it's not possible, and then we get to th second tier, sometimes third tier suppliers. Um, not less important also as a social enterprise. Uh, let me see. 
we publish the cost breakdown of the phone. Um, so you can also go into here and see, okay, what is the reseller margin? What are the investments, operations? And you can see where the money goes to. Um, again, with the same approach, you know, uh, actually this transparency raised a lot of discussions that we were not foreseeing, like, Mm, why do we pay certain amount of money to the authors um, uh, organization in the Netherlands? I don't know if you know, but because the device it's a, it has an internal memory, then we have to pay a tax to the authors uh, organization. And there's a lot of things that people just don't know, and then they can now understand a little bit better thanks to uh, this transparency. Uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation. Sometimes you wish that the computer could read your mind, but that doesn't work yet. Um, okay, so in 2012, I'll, I'll not get too much into the sustainability issues because I want to show you a little bit how we went from idea to company because I think it's also maybe interesting for people that are starting their own uh, companies. So in 2012, that's when we decided to move as a, and become a social enterprise. So we went to this incubator for social and environmental companies, Bethnal Green Ventures in London. Uh, who were crazy enough to give us uh, 16,000 pounds and three months of training to, to start uh, your company. 2013 was the, the year of Fairphone One, finding the Wohong as a supplier, which is, was an amazing experience. Um, getting the community rolling also, getting our you know, newsletter videos and updates about the stuff that we were doing. Um, between January 2013, that was when, when we really started as a as an independent organization, let's say, from the foundation that uh, started the idea of Fairphone. Um, so that was 2,500 people in the newsletter. By the time that we started our crowdfunding campaign, we were in 17,000. And that was thanks to the amazing work of the communications team. Well, at that time, we were like, I believe, like six, seven people, um, something like that. We ran a crowdfunding campaign on our own website as well, because we managed to have already enough traction, so we didn't use uh, Kickstarter or anything like that um, with a very clear proposition. It was like you either buy the product or you don't buy it. You can spread the, the voice, but we don't have t-shirts or other uh, secondary products because we were not only raising money to make it happen, we were also growing a community and we wanted people that were very uh, committed to what we were doing. So we ran the community and it was very, very successful. So we we managed to sell uh, 10,000 devices in, in one month, and we produced Fairphone One, which had a lot of projects already attached, so that's the time of, and you can read much more information on our website, but the Worker Welfare Fund, um, the first uh, democratically elected fund ever. Um, uh, that was the time of the first shipments from Ghana for recycling. There was a lot of projects on, on Fairphone One. Uh, ah, I actually have a slide. So Worker Welfare Fund, uh, more integration of other uh, uh, out of uh, free conflict uh, materials, uh, becoming a B Corp certified uh, social enterprise, and yeah, the beginning of you know the media, uh, etc. Trips. Uh, now the we, with Fairphone Two actually we managed to get the four conflict minerals from out of conflict areas, but still from countries that uh, uh, that, that need it. Uh, as I was saying before. We try to do that or to bring all this as understandable as possible for uh, the people in our community. So this is just as an example. Um, our tiny friend is a capacitor that has tantalum from, from Congo. And that was a, a postcard that you would get uh, with Fairphone One. So just as a, as a way to bring that story to the consumer, to uh, make him understand um, all these problems and what are we doing for them. Well, the first uh, shipments, I, I'm going to go a little bit fast because I also want to hear your questions. I want to give some time for that. Um, after Fairphone 1, we were ready to do something bigger and that was Fairphone 2. So we decided to go into crowdfunding uh, again, uh, also with bank loans. And we designed actually, honestly, the first uh, uh, modular device that hit the market, So, which was a quite uh, a big milestone. Um, that's Fairphone 2. So Fairphone 2 is basically, in a nutshell, uh, a device that is broken down into modules. Those modules are very easy to replace by anybody, so you only need your hands. For the screen, for instance, only your hands. For the other modules there, you need one screwdriver, Philips, no proprietary. Uh, so you can do it very easily. 
And in a nutshell, it's all the components that we know that depend on the use of the consumer. So for instance, your micro USB or your mini jack connection, that depends a lot on uh, the mechanical forces that you put on the phone, let's say, and that may start failing after three, four years. Those are isolated in modules. So when, you know, when the inevitable happens, you can get one of these modules actually for very little money on our website and you can repair it yourself. Also for us as a company, as a small hardware uh, company in this uh, very competitive market, it allows us to have a more flexible model when you can imagine when a component comes end of life uh, from a certain supplier, then we can find another component and maybe redesign only a little bit of one module instead of redesigning sometime the whole phone. So there has also kind of internal uh, benefits for us as well. Another benefit is that now we are doing uh, most of our in-warranty repairs uh, just by sending modules to the consumer. So the consumer, if they have a faulty screen, for instance, they just get a new screen and they can replace it themselves. We save CO2 emissions, saves costs, and the people that in our community are really happy that they don't have to lose their phone and send it to the Netherlands, where's, where we are. Um, so we try to find our ways within this huge industry as a small company to kind of offer uh, a good enough uh, service as well so that, uh, uh, yeah, we have a competitive um, product. We run a lot of studies. So one was a life cycle assessment of Fairphone 2 where you look at the whole environmental footprint uh, of the device. And what we have seen that um, if we are able to extend the lifetime of such a product to five years, you can see a 30% reduction on CO2 emissions. And that is not only up to us, it also requires you know, the consumers and it also requires our partners. So for instance, to keep on producing the spare parts. So it's all together we can uh, get to this number. Um, other things that we've learned, for instance, um, these are, these are the, these, the size of the squares are the contribution to the CO2 emissions of the production of the phone. And what I find remarkable, and I was going after this, this number when we started the study, is this one. So the back cover of the phone, so that's the plastic part behind, uh, which now we have in other colors. Lina, can you raise your, your phone so that they can see? Yeah, so we have new colors and a new, a new model. That's Lina. <laughs> um, so when we changed from the old uh, back cover to the new back cover, um, we knew already that we, because of our model, we cannot push the sales of the new cover, right? Because we are saying you should keep your phone as long as possible and you shouldn't throw things away. But I was looking after that number because actually replacing your back cover is only 0.3% of the CO2 emissions of the production of the phone. So only with a contribution of 0.3%, you actually get a phone that to you feels new. And it gives you that newness feeling again, one year later, that maybe slows down the obsolescence of your product and changes that psychological obsolescence that make you want a new product after one year and a half or two years just by changing a piece of plastic. So we, we try to find this data to also, um, you know, what is most important is that you don't replace this part, which is the core module, which is the center of the phone, no, not of the, the smaller modules, because that's 72% of the CO2 emissions. Um, I'm finishing. Um, we have a great community that supports us uh, in many countries. So this is some of uh, the community members from Austria that run their own um, uh, sometimes exhibitions, sometimes repair cafes, sometimes they just help each other because sometimes we can just not get everywhere. And, and it's amazing and we wouldn't be here without uh, all the people that bought the phone and all the people that help us along the way. I think very relevant to, to people in this fair also, um, we have a strategy on hardware to be able to keep that longevity going, but we also have a strategy on software. And what we want to do with software is to allow as much as possible the decoupling from the hardware itself, so that the, the Fairphone 2 hardware works with as many other operating systems as possible. And sometimes we can do that ourselves, so we do that uh, having two Androids actually that we give with uh, Fairphone 2, one Android with uh, Google Mobile Services, one Android 6 without Google Mobile Services, so you can choose. Uh, it's important for us to give the option to people. Um, but we've been also working with Ubuntu community and Selfish OS community, giving them hardware so that they could uh, do the ports uh, to those operating systems. So we hope that that also in the future will allow the phone to have um, more possibilities than just, let's say, the software that we do.
So I'm just finishing. Um, I think I like to finish with this uh, sentence. I think whatever you are here, maybe you're a consumer that is just interested in knowing what other people are doing, or you are a creator, just think that everything that you're doing where you're putting your money, you are actually uh, making a political act. So you can choose with it. Thanks. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks a lot uh, to you Thanks. and also to Fairphone to have this uh, alternative, uh, let's say. Uh, some questions from the audience. Yeah, some. Hi, um, I'm a hub on 3D hubs. And I, uh, Sorry, I, what, I'm, a, I'm a hub on 3D hubs, so I printed some back covers for the Fairphone one. Um, what, uh, what was the decision uh, to, to do that, to, uh, to make the back covers printable by the community itself? And is it is a similar model for the Fairphone 2 also there or not? Yeah. <laughs> So, as with many things in Fairphone, um, sometimes they don't happen before because of capacity. Please. Sorry, because of capacity. So, the project that he's referring to uh, with Fairphone 1, we did a very beautiful project which was working with 3D hubs and just explain so that people understand. Um, with 3D hubs, which is a distributed network of 3D printers, um, we had a project where we went from idea of the community to actually having the product on our web shop available through uh, you know, a um, collaboration with 3D Hubs, obviously, um, in four hours. So we had a, a, a base design for a back cover for Fairphone 1 uh, designed, and then we would choose one, one 2D design from the community, and we would do it really fast, and pictures and everything renders, and then have it on the shop uh, in less than four hours, which was, an, uh, was a very good project to show like the potential of uh, 3D printing. Now, with Fairphone 2, it is a bit more challenging because with Fairphone 1, it was really an external um, uh, case. With Fairphone 2, the case is much more integrated in the design. So we are planning to just release the, the drawings so that people can try. But it's going to be difficult to get the right tolerance, we think, to, to actually make it click uh, with the phone. It's a little bit more challenging. And that's why it didn't happen yet, because we, we are not sure how to do it. So maybe you have ideas. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm late. You may have asked. The, uh, you may have answered the question before, but um, I'm wondering how realistic or unrealistic would it, would it be to um, push that uh, fabricating things to uh, custom silicon or even full custom silicon? Custom silicon. You Designing the me. chips yourself. I mean, the Snapdragon is mm -hmm. proprietary and it has proprietary programs, and I hate that. <laughs> well, I can tell you, with 70 people and the funding that we have, is completely impossible. That. Uh, or at least with the with the you know with the activities that we are doing. You said impossible. Uh, at this point, yes, but I'm not an expert on that, so maybe you can help us. I'm not semiconductor industry <laughs> okay. or anything, but yeah. Uh, I mean, that's why I asked. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. You said there's a Ubuntu integration or uh, the software Abort, yeah. for Ubuntu in it. One of the key features uh, which were said by Ubuntu um, was that you can attach a screen and um, and you can attach a keyboard mm -hmm. and use it like a real computer uh, on the go. Um, is there a possibility on the Fairphone to do that or is there a module for it or uh, Will it be happen, or is it just a bubble? Um, you catch me a little bit with that question because I wouldn't know actually. Um, what I can answer is that um, we have—I didn't mention it—but we have an expansion port behind uh, the device, uh, which we haven't used yet. So it's, I'll show you. So on the back of the phone, there is an expansion port, which now connects to nothing, actually a piece of plastic. Um, we build it there uh, for the future, so future-proof. So to be able to have some flexibility in the hardware that we develop. So we haven't done anything with it yet. But I guess that's something that we could, uh, we could do through that. This expansion port is nothing more than a USB port, actually. Um, what we are planning there, again, is when, when we have capacity to get there, is to open the documentation for that, you know, like so that anybody knows exactly what every pin does. Um, so I guess 
through there, you know, we could, but still, you know, just to put the, rea the also the, the um, let's say the business part of it, the problem that we have with those kind of propositions very often is that we are still a very small company, right? So we've sold 80,000 Fairphone tools across Europe. Um, so it's very difficult for other companies to step in and say, hey, I'm going to produce this module for you because I mean, the, the total available market for them is still very small. So in those terms, we can do more demonstrators maybe. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question and a good, uh, it would need to follow up, yeah. Okay, I think that the last question, last urgent question. Eh? Um, how did you manage to come up with the modular design so quickly? It was for me out of nowhere and um, other projects like uh, Google Ara with uh, such a huge backing failed. So you think it was quick, but it was not very quick. Uh, we actually originally planned to do it in one year and a half, and it took more than two years, and I think two years, three, four months. So we had a huge delay. It's just that we were working on it silently because you know there was a lot going on around modularity, and we thought like, yeah, let's not make it very public because you know we we also wanted we knew that if we would be able to be the first ones, that would also have an impact on you know the success. Obviously, you know like we as a social enterprise, we need to level also you know the commercial part. Um, so it took much longer than, than, than originally uh, planned. And also, I would say the modularity, if you compare it to what Google Ara wanted to do, is quite different. So Fairphone 2, just again to reiterate on it, is not a, a device that you can customize, let's say, even though we are working, for instance, in an upgrade of the camera, so you will be able to connect a better camera to the old system. Um, but the primary reason is the repairability. So the, the model of being able to put any module anywhere or have two batteries, that is very challenging. And we haven't done that, being honest. So, sorry? Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. So they stopped the project. So, but uh, there's, I think, many reasons why they stopped the project. Also. Before I thank you, I have the last question. Sure. So why they are in Germany completely sold out and Switzerland not? What is the country which buys the most Fairphones? Is this a, which it's is the Germany. most sustainable country? It is Germany, the first uh, ones. And you probably didn't buy it through us, right? You probably buy, bought it from a distributor. So this year we started working with more distributors, which is great because they help us distribute you know, which is very difficult from from the netherlands as a small company so you probably bought it with from a company that had already stock uh from a previous order so um that happens and now if you buy it on on fairphone websites then it's uh, for september that you will get it uh but there are still in other countries some uh, uh yeah some distributors that have some some stock but it's not that we like Switzerland more than Germany or something like that. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks, Miguel. Thanks. It was very interesting. And um, yeah, I've, uh, you have a stand here with a Fairphone also? Oh, yeah, yeah we are so next take, to the entrance the there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so visit, uh, visit the stand uh, of Fairphone and uh, try to get one in September <laughs> at least. Um, okay, I, uh, thanks a lot. Thank yeah. you. Bye.